Bob Crossbeam's gone out of school on Channel. I don't understand what you're saying. One of the crossbeams has gone out of skew on the treadle. But what on earth does that mean? I don't know. Mr Wentworth just told me to come in here and say that there was trouble at the mill, that's all. I didn't expect a kind of Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Hello, folks. Welcome to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, Issue 1, page 15. I am one of your hosts, Rish Outfield. And how are you doing out there, folks? This is Big Anklevich. Yeah, we are actually not in the same room today. We are trying to do this via Skype. Yeah, it's... And how... Hey, Big? Are you... Are you doing something with your voice? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, it just sound. Wait, what did you say? I said I don't know what you're talking about. Oh. I'm just doing my regular voice. Well, it sounds strange, but because we've never done this Skype thing before, it could be just strange because of the headphones, because of the microphone, because of the magic of technology. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. That can be a problem, eh? No, you know, there is something wrong. Are you Are you speaking with an accent right now? I don't think so. No, no, there's definitely an accent there. Um, say the name of the Shakespeare play, Much Ado About Nothing. Much Ado About Nothing? Like that? Big, I, I think you're speaking with a Canadian accent. How could that be? I mean, sure, I was there for a couple of weeks, but that's ridiculous. Okay, okay, let's say that you walk into a living room uh-huh. and you need something to sit down on. Right. What would you look for in the living room to sit down on? Well, I'd grab the remote control, sit down on the Chesterfield, and put on a bit of hockey. All right. Well, let's say that you're sitting on the couch, and uh, you're hungry, and and you just want to whip up something really, really quick. So you go into the kitchen, and you make yourself some orange pasta with cheese. What, What would you call that meal you just made? Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about craft dinner. I love that stuff. I always, I always like to put ketchup on it. That makes it taste really nice. Big. Almost as good as ketchup potato chips. Big. What? what? Macaroni and cheese. And there's no such thing as ketchup-flavored potato chips. What? What is your $2 coin called? Oh, uh, they call that a toonie, of course. No, there is no such thing as a $2 coin. Put Big back on the phone. <laughs> The one who was in no way, shape, or form Canadian. (laughs) Uh, Hey, what is today's story? Today's story is uh, Lost in Memory by Matt Kluchar. Matt Kluchar is 39 years old and lives in Struthers, Ohio. Please, Kim, please. With his wife, Jody, who is 33. He has two children, Alex, who is nine, and Megan, who is seven. He works as a bakery manager, but aspires to be a professional writer. He is now. He has been writing about six years and has had one short story, Cast Out of Darkness, published in two online magazines, Bohemian Alien and Perpetual Magazine. And special thanks to Liz Mirzievsky, Amory Lowe, and Rick Vinhage for lending their voices to this episode, and also to Rick for editing on this episode. Thank you so much. Lost in Memory by Matt Kluchar Peter fiddled with his chess pieces, rubbing his arthritic hands as he ran through different strategies in his head. Which one should I use on you today, Raymond? he said deviously. Peter rarely lost a match to his old friend. He was always a fierce competitor. Ray came mostly for the company. Peter removed his pocket watch from his coat and put it up to his ear to make sure it still worked. Hmm. 1.30. Mark this date down. October 20th, 2055. Raymond is late. The air was a bit chilled as autumn was moving in, and a passing breeze made him zip up his jacket. Peter shivered and rubbed his arms for a little warmth. I sure can't take this cold like I used to. He took his ball cap off, scratching what was left of his hair. 
He and Ray were both 85, and the last ones alive from their old group of friends. Saturday was their day to play chess, grab some coffee, or just sit around and talk. I hope he gets here soon, or we're going to lose this table, Peter said to a busy squirrel bent on ignoring the old man. He surveyed the park again, more than a little surprised to see Ray's son, Kyle, walking towards him. Hey, Kyle, Peter said, standing gingerly to greet him. What brings you here? Hi, Peter, Kyle said, shaking his hand. Peter sat down and motioned to the other chair. Have a seat. Your father should be here any minute, and he better have a damn good excuse why he's keeping me waiting. When he looked at Kyle's face, it was drawn down, and his eyes were puffy as if he were crying. Oh, God, Peter said as his heart sank into his stomach. What happened? Kyle took Peter's hand, and tears filled his eyes. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Peter, but Dad died last night. He went in his sleep. Peter slumped back in his chair, the life draining from him. No, not Ray. I figured you'd be down here waiting for him. And, well, I needed to get some air anyway. Kyle seemed to be speaking to some spot on the sidewalk that only he could see. This was all so unexpected. Peter blinked and then looked at Ray's son, really looked at him. Thank you, Kyle. It was very thoughtful of you to come down here yourself. I'm so sorry about your dad. If there's anything, you know, you just let me know. Kyle smiled and wiped his cheeks. Same here, Peter. I know how close you and Dad were. Well, you better get back to your family. I'll be in touch. The two men stood and embraced, giving each other a manly pat on the back. Hey, Kyle said, why don't you come over to Dad's house for dinner tonight? All of his neighbors have already started to flood us with casseroles, so there's plenty to eat. Thanks, Kyle. Peter attempted a smile. I, I, th I think I will. As the young man walked away, Peter tried to process the sad fact that he'd now outlived his three best friends he'd had since kindergarten. With shaky hands, he busied himself cleaning up the chess pieces, trying to choke back the tears. When he looked up, he saw the once busy squirrel now sitting on its hind legs, tilting its head almost compassionately at Peter. I never thought I'd be the last to go, he said to the animal, almost expecting it to say something back. But when a few other people looked at him strangely, Peter felt sheepish. Oh, what do you know anyway, he said to the squirrel. Peter flung one of his chess pieces at it, and the squirrel scampered away, returning to its business. Walking the two blocks back home, it seemed like twenty today. He somehow managed the entire trip without crying. But once inside his small ranch house, he stumbled over to the couch, almost falling into it. Shock gave way to sorrow as his body convulsed with heaving <laughs> sobs for what seemed like forever. When he finally felt a temporary relief from the pain, Peter pushed himself up and cleaned off his face with a handful of tissues. He slowly looked around the living room, at all of the pictures lining the mantels and coffee tables that created a museum of his life. He realized that they were all that he had now, the pictures and his memories. Peter had outlived his parents, a sister and brother, his wife of 55 years, his daughter Gabrielle, and now all of his friends. His son Jacob was still alive, but much too busy with his own life to be a part of his father's. Peter picked up a silver frame from the end table, which had a picture of his wife in it. She still brought a smile to his face. I'm all alone now, Lynn. Why did I have to be the only one left? Doesn't God know I can't handle this? You're up there right now. See if you could talk to him for me, he said with a chuckle that devolved into more crying. <laughs> I can't do this by myself. Peter's face became angry, and he yelled up to the ceiling. Did you hear that? Why did you leave me alone, God? Why? Peter placed the picture back into the dust outline where he had found it, and curled up on the couch. You were a good man, Ray. Peter began to think back to all of the crazy times he and his friends had together. The first memory to jump out of him was when they first tried smoking. Did you get him? Peter said. Well, sort of. 
Ray said as he exited the gas station. They wouldn't sell me cigarettes, but they sold me chewing tobacco and rolling papers. Figure that one out. Yeah, that makes sense, Bruce said. I'm going to get something to eat before we leave. I'm starving, Paul said. Hey, get something to drink while you're in there, too, Peter said. The boys figured Ray had the best chance of buying cigarettes because he looked the oldest. At the age of 14, he already had a full mustache and a five o'clock shadow. But even though this particular gas station usually didn't ask for ID, their plan still failed. Let him go, Paul said with a mouthful of Little Debbie Swiss cake rolls. The rest of the box was under his arm, and his hands distributed several bottles of soda. It was summertime, and the boys were just looking for places to hang out and pass the time. Not much else to do in a small suburban town. They reached one of their usual spots, which was nothing more than a small maintenance garage for a local speech and hearing center. But it was secluded enough to give them a sense of their own space. All right, Ray said. Let's make some cigarettes. His father was an old hippie, so Ray was quite skilled at the art of rolling. These are probably going to taste like crap, Bruce said. Here, Paul said, handing him a cake roll. Eat one of these in between hits. Here you go, boys, Ray said, giving them each their own cigarette and following it up with a lighter. Their first drag sent them all into a coffee spree, which they quickly doused by gulping soda. And the horrible taste of the burning chewing tobacco was followed by alternate bites of Swiss cake rolls. This is nasty, Peter said. They all knew he was right, but nobody wanted to stop. <coughs> Maybe it gets better once you get used to it, Paul said. And so they continued until all of them were lying down on the ground, nauseated from a mix of non-filtered carcinogens and sugar. Oh, Paul moaned. This was so stupid. What the hell were we thinking? Said Bruce. Hey, Ray, said Peter. Next time, let's just get some smokes off your dad. They all broke out in laughter as they realized this small oversight in their plans for the day. Peter woke up suddenly, or at least it seemed like he woke up, and was overcome with nausea. He grabbed a small wastebasket and heaved, but nothing came out. Given his emotional state, he thought nothing of it. But when he got up to grab an ice pack, his legs gave way, and he slumped back onto the couch. Wow, all of that crying must have taken more out of me than I thought. What was really strange was the taste that he had in his mouth. What the hell? It's like a mix of tobacco, Swiss cake rolls, and soda. Man, my mind must be messing with me. I gotta get moving. Peter shook off the strange sensation and made his way to the bathroom. He splashed some cold water on his face and took a quick look in the mirror. Aren't you a pretty sight? he said to his reflection. Peter's face was pale and his eyes looked sunken in, but again he passed this off to all of the crying. As he got ready to walk over to Ray's, he decided that he would at least try to get a hold of his son and tell him what happened. The phone call ended with the usual disappointment. Voicemail. What a surprise, Peter said. Hey, Jake, it's your father. Remember the old guy who helped bring you into this world? Anyway, I just thought I would let you know that my old friend Ray just passed away. I'm feeling kind of lonely and wanted to talk. Peter got a lump in his throat, and he could barely get his last words out. He knew they would be all but ignored. Give me a call when you get a chance. I love you, son. When Peter arrived at Ray's, he was greeted warmly by the whole family. Boy, you weren't kidding about the food, Peter said as he looked around the kitchen. Casserole dishes and meat trays covered every space that was available. I told you, Kyle said. Help yourself, Peter. You look like you could use something to eat. Kyle looked at Peter with concern. Are you feeling all right? Peter waved him off. I'll be okay as soon as I can stop crying. Kyle smiled and patted him on the back. I know what you mean. Peter made himself a moderate plate and engaged in some small talk with Kyle's wife Sandy and the kids. He felt awkward being around Kyle and his siblings as they went over the funeral arrangements. So Peter went into the next room, which was raised in. He picked lightly at his food as he looked at the small collection of his friend's life that surrounded him. The walls were decorated with not just old pictures, but also sports memorabilia, several army medals, drawings from the grandchildren, and some paintings that Peter had done for him. 
one photograph in particular caught his eye. Oh my, he said. Would you look at us? It was a portrait of himself, Ray, Paul, and Bruce, all dressed up like the band Motley Crue for Halloween. Yeah, I think we idolized them a little too much, he said, as he faded into another memory. The school day was over and the boys were at Paul's house, head-banging in the living room and playing air guitar as the latest Motley Crue video played on MTV. Paul's mom worked every day until five, leaving him and his friends time to blow off steam without adult supervision. Look at that! Peter shouted, pointing at the television as the video ended. Whoa! No way! Ray said. I bet we could do that! Let's do it! Bruce agreed. Paul, you got any gas? Out in the garage. Paul said as the four of them filed out the door. What caught their attention was the image of a burning pentagram, which they were now going to attempt to recreate in Paul's backyard. And so the gas was poured, the ground was lit, and the rest of the day was filled with various other experiments in pyrotechnics. Each one began with a, Dude, let's try this, and ended with a, That was so cool! They doused toy cars with gas and ran them through small fires just to watch them explode. They made walls of flames on the driveway and rode their bikes through them. And of course, no day would be complete without the classic aerosol can turned torch. But that evening would be the coup de grace. Paul's mother was going out and, even though he was 14, she insisted on having a babysitter come over. Of course, the sitter was his cousin, who was only two years older than him so it was pretty much a free-for-all for the boys. Once it was dark, they took the now-empty gas can up the street for a refill. They'd devised a simple plan to pour the whole gallon onto the street in front of Paul's house and light it, just to see what would happen. Any cars coming? Paul asked nervously as he emptied the contents. All clear, Ray answered, looking back and forth. Paul kept going from one side of the street to the other, giddy with anticipation at what the result would be like. Peter crouched on the curbside with his lighter at the ready. Hurry up! He said, I'm going to light it. Ray and Bruce couldn't help but laugh at the thought of their friend (laughs) engulfed in flames. Come on, I'm serious, Peter said, and continued to taunt Paul. Wait a minute, man, Paul protested. I'm almost done. Don't you light it. They went back and forth until Peter could no longer contain himself and flicked the lighter just as Paul was running for the edge of the street. And so with the first spark, the street exploded in a huge fireball, which accelerated Paul's leap from within and sent Peter somersaulting backwards. The four of them went running back into the house, looking back the whole time in admiration of their crowning achievement. Once inside, they watched from the window as the flames slowly died down. Several neighbors peered out from their houses, and a few motorists had to get out of their cars and stare in wonder at what was blocking the road. After a round of high fives, the boys checked themselves for any major injuries. Peter had singed some arm hair where he had held the lighter, but other than that, everyone was fine. Almost in unison, the friends declared, That That was was so so awesome! awesome. Peter smiled and shook his head as the memory faded. Man, we were brain damaged, he chuckled. (laughs) Sandy entered the room just then and jumped back when she saw him. Whoa, you scared the heck out of me, Peter. Oh, sorry, Sandy. I'm just reminiscing a little. That's fine, she said as she busied herself packing up some old books. It's just that you weren't here a minute ago. What are you talking about? Peter said, thinking she was joking. I came in here right after I got my food. Peter, I'm telling you, I came in to pack some books, and the room was empty. I stepped out into the next room to get a box, came right back in, and you were there. You know, you move pretty fast for an old man. She said, but Peter wasn't laughing. He knew that he had been in the den for at least ten minutes, and he didn't remember Sandy entering the first time. As he was trying to make sense of it, a strange smell interrupted his train of thought. It was the unmistakable scent of burnt hair. Peter slowly looked down in total disbelief at what he saw. There on his right arm was a small, smooth patch where his hair had been just minutes earlier. Oh my God, he said almost in a whisper. Well, what the hell is going on? Sandy stopped what she was doing. Peter, are you all right? You're starting to look worse than when you came in. No, no, I'm not. I think I need to go home now. Kyle! Sandy shouted over her shoulder, not taking her eyes off Peter. Yeah? He answered, appearing in the doorway. As his eyes followed Sandy's, he saw Peter still staring at his arm and looking like he was going to pass out. Hey, Peter, 
Kyle said, taking him by the shoulders. What's wrong? Peter slowly looked back up. I don't know. I I think I need to get some rest, that's all. Are you sure? Kyle asked. I could take you to the hospital if you want. You look terrible. Gee, thanks, Kyle. That makes me feel much better. Sorry. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. Yeah, Peter agreed. I I guess it's too much for me to be around all of this right now. I'll drive you home, Peter, Kyle said. The ride back to Peter's house was a very quiet one until they pulled into his driveway. You know, my family and I were talking, and we would really like it if you'd deliver Dad's eulogy. I mean, if you don't feel up to it, that's okay. It's just, you probably knew him better than anybody. What do you think? Peter was moved, almost to tears. Kyle, I I would consider it an honor. Thank you, Peter, he said, shaking his hand. Get some rest. I'll call you about the service. As he got ready for bed, Peter's head was swimming with confusion and fear over the strange events that had followed his memories. The first one, he could explain, as just some powerful brain stimulus. But how could he make sense of the arm hair burned in the same spot as the night of the fire? Maybe I'll figure it out tomorrow, he said as he drifted off to sleep. The next day found Peter camped out on a park bench, oblivious to the world around him as he jotted down ideas for Ray's eulogy. And although he was engrossed by his speech, he avoided getting too deep into his memories. He still couldn't make sense out of what had happened yesterday, and he had no desire to repeat it. Maybe writing things down would keep him from having to visualize it in his mind, which was what seemed to trigger everything. It was another cold day, but without a cloud in the sky, making it a busy day at the park. People strolled around admiring the fall colors, kids ran about playing tag, and others just sat and watched all of the activity. Peter was so focused that he didn't even notice someone sitting down beside him. Beautiful day today, said the voice next to Peter. Yeah, Peter said, not even looking away from his paper. Sure is. What you working on? The stranger asked. Oh, just writing some things down, he said, waving off the stranger's inquiry. Looks like a eulogy to me, the stranger replied. Excuse me, Peter said as he quickly broke from his work. This is kind of a private matter here. But as he looked at the man, who was now leaning towards him, craning his neck, a strange sensation replaced his anger. Although Peter didn't know him, there was a strong feeling of familiarity between them. The man was elderly, about Peter's own age, with a heavy flannel coat and wispy white hair that stuck out from under his fedora. The stranger's smile was warm and inviting. Name's Gabe. Pleasure to meet you, he said as he held out his hand. Yeah, Peter said, slowly returning the gesture. Same here. Peter just sat and stared for a moment, scrunching his eyebrows. Do I know you? You know, I get that a lot. I guess I just have a common face. So, am I right about the eulogy? Uh, yeah. Actually, he was an old friend of mine. One of my best friends. Something about Gabe made Peter want to open up. Maybe it was their common age that made him feel more comfortable. But whatever the case, Peter and Gabe went on talking the rest of the afternoon. Mostly about friends and family that had passed on. I've never felt this alone before, Peter said. I've been on my own now for many years, but you never quite get used to it. Yeah, it's good to have someone to talk to. Thanks, Gabe, Peter said as he patted him on the shoulder. Anytime. Well, I should get going. I'm sure I'll see you around, Pete. I'd like that, Gabe. It was now the day of Ray's funeral, and Peter found himself a little nervous. It had been a beautiful service up until now, although Peter had spent most of the time going over his notes. But soon it was time for the eulogy. Peter made his way up to the front, looked across the hundreds of people staring back at him, and simply smiled. And with that, his uneasiness passed. It's good to see so many people have come to pay their respects to my old friend Raymond. 
as you can tell, he was a dearly loved man. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter, and I was friends with Ray since we were in kindergarten. I guess that's why they asked me to perform the eulogy, because I knew him so well. But he was an easy man to get to know. Ray never tried to hide who he was or apologize for it. You either liked him or you didn't, and either way was okay by him. As I tried to sum up the kind of person he was, one major thing stuck out in my mind. Ray was the kind of person who would always be there for you, no matter what the cost was to himself. He proved that in his service to this country, but he also did it in his everyday life as well. I'd like to tell you a story about when he demonstrated this to me. As Peter read the words, he could not help but picture it all over again. It was another day at the maintenance garage, and the boys were again trying to entertain themselves. There had apparently been some digging going on because they were surrounded by huge piles of dirt. Dude, I wish we would have brought our bikes. These would be awesome to climb, Paul said. We could always go home and get them, Bruce said. Or, Ray said, grabbing a handful of dirt, We could have a dirt ball fight! He threw his clump at Peter, and the melee began. They quickly separated into two teams and loaded up with as much ammunition as they could carry. Come on, Paul, Peter said to his ally. Let's get up on the roof of the garage and bomb them. Take cover, Bruce, Ray said as they dove behind a dirt bunker. The battle waged on, but Paul noticed Peter using an unwise strategy. Hey, man, don't get so close to the edge. Your momentum is going to take you right over. Now, I'm all right. You worry too much, Peter said. But the next shot proved Paul right as Peter began to fall forward. Quickly, he did the only thing that he could think of, which was to throw his legs out from under himself and fall straight down onto his chest. The impact hurt like hell, but it was better than the alternative. As he looked down, there was Ray with his arms stretched out waiting to catch his friend. You okay, man? Ray yelled from below. Yeah, Peter replied in a labored voice. I think so. The battle came to a close and they headed home. Peter lifted his shirt to see if there was any damage. Oh, wow, that's nasty, Paul said. Well, it could have been worse, Peter said. The others looked as Peter showed off his battle scar, a shallow cut the length of his upper body where the corner of the roof had connected. Thanks for being there, buddy, he said as he slapped Ray's shoulder. After Peter had finished the story, he looked around again to see a silent and stunned crowd. He looked to Kyle to ask him if something was wrong, but before any words could leave his mouth, Peter was overcome by dizziness and passed out. When he regained consciousness, Peter found himself staring at the ceiling of a hospital room. He looked around groggily, trying to piece together what had happened, and was surprised to see who was sitting next to the bed. How how the hell did you find me here, Gabe? I was sitting on the back row at the funeral, Gabe answered. That was quite a show. Oh, I feel terrible for letting that happen. Ray's family is enough to deal with. Do you even know what exactly happened? Peter closed his eyes and tried to remember, but he was interrupted by the sound of a doctor entering the room. Mr. Kluchar, how are we feeling? He said as he looked at his chart. You tell me, doctor, Peter said. Are you family? He asked Gabe. Uh, He's a close friend, Peter answered. It's okay. Very well, the doctor replied. As he flipped through a few pages, he rubbed his crinkled forehead. I must say, Mr. Kluchar, I've never seen a case quite like yours. Uh, That's not very comforting, Doc. I'm sorry, I just don't know how else to put it. These test results just don't make any sense. What do you mean? I I thought I just passed out. Well, there's more to it than that. Have you noticed any decline in your health before today? Peter's blood went cold as he thought about his answer. I have been feeling a lot weaker the last few days. People have even noticed that I don't look well. But but I just thought it was due to the stress from my friend's death. Peter swallowed hard as he asked the next question. What's happening to me? The doctor looked up from his clipboard and gave a heavy sigh. Mr. Kluchar, these tests are showing me that there are cells in your body that are missing. 
I can't explain it, but there is simply empty space where they should be. And it's not just in one spot. It's happening throughout your entire body. Peter tried to get his mind around the strange diagnosis. He couldn't help but wonder if this was somehow connected to his memories. I have some specialists flying in tomorrow, but until then, you need to stay here for observation. I don't want to try anything further until I'm sure of what I'm dealing with. Uh, there's one more thing, not near as major. Can you tell me how you got that scar on your chest? It looks like you fell on something when you passed out. Peter looked down and felt underneath his gown. There were bandages in the same spot as the cut he had gotten from the roof when he was younger. I don't know, he said almost in a whisper. I thought that healed up a long time ago. Well, no matter. That's the least of your worries. Right now we need to focus on your main problem. Try to get some rest and I'll see you tomorrow morning. The doctor jotted down a few more things on his chart and left the room. Peter looked at Gabe. Not only had his new friend been silent this whole time, but he didn't seem at all phased by the doctor's report. Gabe, what happened at the funeral? Gabe grabbed Peter's hand. Peter, I'm going to tell you what's going on, but you may not believe me. You'd be surprised at what I'm willing to believe lately. During the eulogy, when you started to tell your story, you disappeared. What do you mean I disappeared? I mean, one second you were there, and the next second you weren't. It didn't last long, but long enough to scare the heck out of everyone. The pieces started to come together for Peter now. The same thing must have happened to him at Ray's house when he startled Sandy. I know what's happening to you, Peter, because I've seen it before. Peter squeezed his friend's hand like a frightened child. Please, Gabe, you have to tell me. Peter, you're holding on to your memory so strongly that you have created a sort of bridge to the past. And each time you remember, you're actually traveling over that bridge physically and reliving those events in your life. The only problem is, when you come back, you leave a piece of yourself behind. That was what the doctor saw. But how is that even possible? I know it's a lot to take in, but think about it, Peter. The cut, the burnt arm hair, and the strange taste of tobacco and cake rolls? You got them all right after you remembered the events surrounding them. Peter withdrew his hand, and his eyes became like saucers. How did you know about all of that? Gabe gently took Peter's hand again and looked on him with pity. Peter, there are some things that I can't explain to you. You're just going to have to trust me. Peter's face softened. I, I do, Gabe. Although I can't say exactly why. That's good. Because I'm going to tell you what you have to do. You have to let go of your memories, Peter, and move on. Peter's eyes filled with tears, and his body convulsed with sobbing. Gabe, my memories are all I have now. I didn't say it would be easy, Peter. But if you don't, you'll die for sure. Peter continued to cry as Gabe embraced him. And although sleep was the farthest thing from his mind, he felt an overwhelming peace in Gabe's arms and drifted off. Peter didn't wake up until early the next morning, to the prodding of the nurses making their rounds. When they were done, he got out of bed and went to the window. Gabe was gone now, but Peter kept going over what he had said. The sun was beginning to rise over the hillside, which just happened to be overlooking the cemetery where Peter's late wife was buried. Since he was not hooked up to anything at the moment, he decided to get dressed and go for a walk. He peeked out of his doorway, and when it was all clear, he snuck out and went across the street. Peter quickly found Lynn's grave and sat down on a bench next to it. Morning, dear. How are you? I guess you know how I'm doing. Peter took a breath of the fresh morning air, sighed, and shook his head. Ah, it's quite a fix I'm in, you know. You always told me I lived in the past too much, but I never thought it could kill me. I'm all alone, Lynn. If I can't embrace my memories anymore, then what do I have left? 
Peter's face became contorted with emotional pain, and he felt as if all of his strength was leaving his body. I'm tired, Lynn. I don't know if I have any fight left in me. I just wish we were together again. Really together. You always knew how to make it all right. Peter looked across the cemetery and saw Gabe sitting on another bench. As his friend smiled back at him, Peter could have sworn that his face was shining with a radiant light. Gabe just nodded his head, knowing somehow what Peter was already thinking about doing. Peter smiled back and let his thoughts begin to drift. You know, Lynn, I remember the first time that we met. Author's Note The idea for this story came to me when I got together with some old friends of mine that I hadn't seen for years. We sat around and laughed for hours about all the crazy things we used to do. I started to think that one day I would like to write about those old times. But being a writer of speculative fiction meant that it couldn't be just a typical memoir. It would have to have something a little weird to tie it all together. I've always had a hard time letting go of the past. And as I kept going over the memories of my friends, the story began to form. I decided to put myself as the main character and use everyone's middle names. Yes, the stories of our youth were real, a fact to which my mother replied, I'm so glad that I didn't know what you were doing. I would have had a heart attack. Thanks, Mom. After reading this story, the main question in everyone's mind was, What? How did I die? I also got a lot of, So, you plan on outliving all of us? But overall, it was so much fun retelling the tales of one of the most precious times of my life. I also saw it as a sort of warning to myself, though I didn't intend this at first. Memories are wonderful, but I need to stop living in the past so much, or it may tear me apart inside. Welcome back. I hope you've enjoyed the story. I know I did. Thank you, announcer man. I, I did enjoy it. How about you, Rish? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I was miles away in my youth back when I used to soil myself and laugh about it. But enough yes. about last Thursday. <laughs> uh, I, I, I really liked this story, too. I'm a big look back in anger kind of guy. <laughs> I don't know. This story, really, I really responded to it. Cool. The end. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the the Douchebag Audio Fiction Magazine. <laughs> this is M. Night Shyamalan, and you're listening to the Douchebag Audio Fiction Magazine. <laughs> he mispronounces his own name. <laughs> we claim that it's him. Hey, that ain't funny, man. M. Night Shyamalan is a musical genius. He's of our modern day. <laughs> his writing will bring the whole world together in an era of peace and harmony. Is it okay if I insult M. Night Shyamalan? Shyamalan a ding dong? Yeah, I'm gonna suggest you cut out the last minute and a half. Don't ask me, ask the droid. Ah, uh, yes. You know, the thing that I really enjoyed about this story, I am, like you, one of those people that likes to look back in anger. I enjoy going through old memories, times of Yor and Yon, when uh, I was a younger man. And uh, speaking uh, of yawn, I really enjoy that kind of stuff, too. The thing that really uh, hit home with me was the memory that he had of seeing the Shout at the Devil video from uh, Motley Crue. And then they go out in their uh, backyard and recreate this uh, flaming pentagram on his backyard. The funny thing is, is in that author's note, he says that his mom th said, oh, man, if I only knew what you were doing. Wouldn't a pentagram burned into your back lawn be something that would hint you into the fact that they're doing something naughty? Uh, you know, I had a very sheltered childhood. I only know Dr. Feelgood. What was this video? Shout at the Devil? Have you heard the song? Sadly, no. Oh, okay. It wasn't anything amazing. I, mean, I, I plan to someday. Okay. Not see the video, but shout at the devil. Okay. It wasn't like an amazing video or anything, but at the end of the video, there's a spot where there's a pentagram made out of flames sitting on the ground that uh, that's, I think, the end part that they fade out on. 
telling a story from my childhood while we're at it. Um, when I was a kid, me and some of my friends got into... Witchcraft, devilry. No. Satanism. Me and some of my friends got into making things with gasoline and flames. <laughs> my friends and I made Molotov cocktails, homemade. We used Snapple bottles, if I remember right, to make them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, one night I fell asleep at my friend's house and they lit my sock on fire. It was nice of them. Why you were wearing it? Yes, I was wearing it, but I was asleep and didn't know, and they put it out before it burned me. I hope you weren't wearing it <laughs> Red Hot Chili pepper style. As a matter of fact. No, but another night when I actually wasn't present, they went out with the video camera, and at the time, this was already an old-fashioned video camera. It was one of those friggin' video cameras where the camera connected by way of a cord to a separate VCR that recorded the signal from the camera. So these guys were lugging around a camera and a VCR and videotaping themselves throw these bombs in the street. And they would throw it, it would explode in giant ball of flame, and then they'd run out there and like dance around the flame like a bunch of idiots. So what happened is somebody came out and saw them doing this and grabbed them, you know, and they, they tried to run away, but they had this friggin' big old video camera and VCR to carry along. Yeah, they couldn't get away with it. He did manage, my friend did manage to stash the video camera behind a bush. And so the person who caught them didn't know that they had been out there taping it as well. But he took them inside their house. And luckily for my friends, they didn't wind up in juvenile hall because he was a neighbor that already knew who he was. And so he called his parents instead of calling the police. So my friends, uh, they got in big trouble. They were grounded for quite some time for that. Now, and had you been there with them, you would have partaken in that punishment, right? Yes, I, I'm sure I would have. I'm glad to not know what my parents would have punished me with at that time. And the funny thing was, later on in the school year, my friends had to do a kind of a how-to presentation for one of their classes. So <laughs> one of those same doofus friends took the video from them throwing bombs, edited it together with whiplash from Metallica playing in the background and did this whole presentation in his class on how to make a Molotov cocktail. <laughs> it's funny to think about that because, dude, he'd probably be in jail again for doing that because you do anything like that in a school these days and they automatically call the Homeland Security or whoever. I guess it's probably not Homeland Security, but post-Columbine, you can't pull anything like that in class. You can't even make a list and say... Ah, I hate these people. People I want dead. You know, if they find a list like that, you go to jail these days. You get accused of a plot. But yeah, back in my day growing up, and you could get away with being a kid, now you're not allowed to anymore. Well, it's as my mom used to say, one piece of shit ruins it for everybody else. Yeah. One bad apple spoils the whole bunch. That's probably what she said. Maybe the only equivalent I can think of besides like mooning passing cars for no reason, was uh, my buddy Rhett got asked to the Sadie Hawkins dance. They had that in Guam where you were raised, right? Yeah. yeah you Guamanians believe in Sadie Hawkins. We believe in Sadie Hawkins. I believe Hawkins. in Sadie Hawkins. <laughs> so Rhett got asked by this girl to the Sadie Hawkins dance. I believe in Sadie Hawkins. And he told me and my friend to respond to her, to give her the affirmative that he would go. And I came up with this idea of, jeez, <laughs> that we were stories, we were gonna it? put black robes on and devil masks on <laughs> and go to her house in the middle of the night, <laughs> ring her doorbell, and in gasoline r have written Y E S on her driveway. And as the door opened, we, one of us would have a lit candle, and would <laughs> bend down and light the yes. Now, why we thought that she would answer the door and not her father, I can't say, but we wore the devil masks. and You made a gasoline yes on the driveway. Yeah. We poured, and it, I, I think it was gasoline. Maybe it was kerosene, kerosene or something. Fluid. You know, it, I think it was lighter fluid in the can. I held the candle. He held the, the liquid of whatever it was. So we rang the doorbell. Oh, goodness. And I guess... Danielle's mother came to the door first and looked out and then ran to get 
her husband. <laughs> and then Danielle came to the door to see what the matter was. What the hubbub was. And by then she saw yes. And she put two and two together and she's like, guys, Rish, is that you? And Brett had instructed us not to say anything the whole time. And so Dennis and I just stayed silent. And she said, guys, I, is that you? And finally, like Dennis <laughs> nodded really big with the devil mask on. And she says, my dad is going to get his gun. You guys got to get out of here. <laughs> and so, of course, we ran away and we left the yes to burn, feeling like, well, this is never going to get back to us or anything like that. But it's one of those where after we went back to, to report to Rhett, he was just like, oh, man, he was going to get his gun. We should have called her first to tell her to wait by the door or something. Why didn't we do that? <laughs> and it's one of those stories that we told for a long time of how stupid we were and how lucky we were that, that it didn't, didn't go terribly wrong. He didn't have the gun more handy. Yeah, he blew Dennis's head off. You know, so I, I don't tell the story as much as I want to because, you know. They're... So this story was kind of interesting. Um <laughs> Not mine, obviously. It was interesting with this story. Uh, some of our readers and, uh, frankly, I also had a little bit of uh, a problem. I was a little uneasy about the part where the doctor examines this guy and he tells him, oh, we got a, a weird thing going on here. Our tests are showing that there are cells in your body that are missing. I can't explain it, but there's just empty space. You know, just kind of weird. Like, how, how could that happen within your body if you can't see it? If a cell disappears, would the space around it kind of close or something? I don't know. But it just seemed kind of strange, a little vague or non-doctorly. And so we uh, mentioned that to Matt. And we figured, I guess, that you could get away with it because it's set where somebody from today is 90 years old. So it was what, like 2060 or something like that is when this story is supposed to be set. So we mentioned it to him and he was just like, nah, I don't know what else to do there. So we'll just leave it the way it is. It was basically his way of saying that he was leaving parts of himself behind in the past. And he didn't want the guy to come back with missing limbs or, you know, the end of his nose was missing or something like that. So he just left it as it is. So it was an interesting thing. And I, I guess, you know, you can easily see past it because, again, you know, it's in 2080 or whatever. It's all the way in the year 2010. I, I, I guess it's all about suspension of disbelief, uh, probably. Just in reading the story, I, yeah, frankly, just liked it so much that if there was that problem, I didn't notice it i just was too wrapped up in into in the character and in the narrative that was going on and uh you know that the suspension of disbelief is a it's a tenuous thing if i'm using that word right it's fragile it's easily breakable uh-huh yeah anytime you see a bad cg sot bam suspension of disbelief out the window we should do an episode where we talk about really really bad special effects yeah sometime. that's a good idea and i i'm sure everybody has experiences where they were totally with something, and then something took them out of it, the story. Something took them out of the movie. Something took them out of the TV show. I, I'm reminded in the documentary that's on the Jaws Laserdisc and DVD. Why did I say Laserdisc? <laughs> because I have a long white beard. I'm reminded, though, uh, that there's this part on the documentary for Jaws that's on the DVD, and mm -hmm. it was on the Laserdisc, too, if you want to have a long white beard like I do. Oh. And uh, they're talking about the end of the movie and Peter Benchley, who wrote the, the novel Jaws, was sort of a consultant, sort of a producer in a way. Sort of a pain in the butt on the set. I, I think sort of, yes. And <laughs> this kid, this kid, you know, who had only ever made one movie was directing this this film of his book. And so I think he was really protective of it and he was suspicious of the changes that had been made. And in the end of the book, Jaws, the shark is harpooned with a uh, cable or line of some sort and it tangles up in that cable and it drowns and that's how the shark is killed but steven spielberg had this idea of having the shark get a canister of compressed air in its mouth and sheriff brody shoots the canister and the shark explodes and speaking of exploding, I guess that's exactly what Peter Benchley did when he read this part of the script. And he tried to explain to this kid, Spielberg, that that's just impossible. That, that's just silly. That's ludicrous. 
And nobody's going to believe that. And he was talking about the research that he had done about sharks and that, that he wanted to do away with misconceptions. And this script was filled with things that would further the misconceptions that sharks are monsters and, that, that you know, this and that. And Spielberg told him, there are a few things that I've done in this movie that are sort of iffy as far as science goes. But if I've done my job well of telling the story, by the time we get to that last scene where he shoots the oxygen tank, the audience will believe that the shark would blow up. It's like, if I've done my job, they will be with me right. completely. If they believe that the shark got up onto the boat and ate Quint off of the boat, if they bought that, then they're going to buy this exploding shark at the end. And Benchley just said, you know, you're wrong. And, and I, I, I don't know exactly how much of a stink he made or whether he was removed from was the set or whatever. He was out from the set and was not allowed back. He was Harlan Ellison right off the set. <laughs> but he later said that when he saw the movie and when Brody shoots that shark and it explodes, the people stood up and cheered. And he looked around and he realized that the kid had been right and that he had been wrong. To his credit, he does say that on the documentary. And uh, and that's cool. That's one of those things where you're just like, wow, that guy is on record as saying that he was wrong. And make <laughs> me it made me like Benchley more. Yeah. But I think we were talking about suspension of disbelief. Right. The story just totally carried me. So to the part where the old man travels back in time and comes back and a shark has taken a big chunk out of his side, <laughs> <laughs> I was able to buy it. Yeah, no, that's, uh, it is definitely a uh, part of it. If, you, if you've convinced him so far that uh, this stuff is happening then you know you could keep on taking them further and i guess with everybody you know there's a a limit that they'll go to i find myself coming across that limit a lot watching like action movies and stuff these days because action stars are just so friggin indestructible they'll be shot like more than once and it hurts them for a while they fall down on the ground and they're ah but then they get up and they finish the rest of the movie doing all sorts of things that a person who's been shot wouldn't be able to do or what's worse is you know they perform feats of action herodom that's just not possible for a, a real person to perform. Well, my, my personal favorite is the riding an explosion, like it's a wave. Explosion blows him clear as he flies with it. I, I don't know if that's passe, if, if people other than Michael Bay dare do the whole riding of explosions thing anymore. <laughs> I, I think they probably have more sense than that, right? Yeah, well... Oh, and, and another thing that I hate is when a human being is replaced by a CG rendition of that person so that they can be thrown against a wall or rattled around in a monster's hand or jump 25 feet or whatever, because obviously a human being could yeah. never sustain that kind of pain or pressure or leap or whatever. You know, it's fine in certain cases, you know, when they've gone out of their way to show you that something is different about these people. They're not just normal people. They're crouching tiger, hidden dragon people that can run on the tops of trees or do something unusual. Chinese is the word you're looking for. Oh, they've shown you that these people are Chinese. And that makes it all right. <laughs> and so therefore they can do these things. But, you know, I, I can't stand it when Sylvester Stallone or Arnold Schwarzenegger or Vin Diesel, I guess, to make it a little more contemporary, is doing this kind of crap. I hate it when Lee Van Cleef is... <laughs> Hume Cronin! <sighs> Mommy, this movie has David Paymer in it? Oh, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> no, honey, it's Stephen Paymer. Even better! Warning, today's comments from Rish Outfield are especially stupid. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you, announcer man. You're always there to get my back. Did you edit this story? Uh, I edited part of it. I basically just went through and put in the sound effects and... Uh, the majority of the work was done by Rick, our resident editor, our resident helper, our oh, resident... Resident evil. Our resident do-everything does a great job for us at many things. But yes, editing is one of his uh, specialties. And, and so in listening to it all edited together by Rick, our renaissance man, <laughs> did you find that you still had a problem with that part or... No, you know, it doesn't bother me. I, to tell you the truth, it didn't bother me that much to begin with, I think. It was more the fact that one of our readers had already pointed it out to me before I read the story that uh, I was already, I guess, expecting it. 
Nobody expects. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Our chief weapon <laughs> is surprise. Surprise and fear. Our two chief weapons. Our surprise and fear and ruthless efficiency. Three. Our three chief weapons. At the Dune Steve Audio our Fiction Magazine, we pay our authors. Weaponry. So if you love also good fiction and want to see it continue, please press the button. So, hey, we're back on Skype. Yeah, I, I love this technology stuff. It's great. We should have done a show while I was in Canada, except for there was just a black hole there with no internet, so it wouldn't have worked out. Is that true? Yeah, I was like in the middle of nowhere, out on a farm. Wow, you know, part of me finds that really, really interesting, but part of me is just horrified by the thought of spending weeks in Canada. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, since I didn't have anything to do, I managed to write a story. Oh, well, hey, that's cool. That doesn't happen very often. No, that's for sure. I uh, I did go camping over the last weekend, and uh, I finished up a story myself, so. Oh, right on. Yeah, it's just, it's just the getting away from it all, getting away from the distraction of either the internet or the TV or porn or... Did I mention porn? Yeah, I think you said it twice. I didn't mean to say that. I meant to say going to hymn practice. Ah. Yes, at the local cathedral. That does take up a lot of time. So anyways, oh. You all right? Sorry, my stomach's really bugging me. I I ate a whole tube of ketchup-flavored Pringles and another tube of dill-pickled-flavored, and I had a Wonder Bar and a Coffee Crisp, and then I had a order of fries with some gravy on them, and uh, my stomach is... I feel, I feel like I'm going to puke. Well, hey, maybe we should continue this uh, next week, or, or we would talk a little bit about our trips then. Big, are you still there? Yeah, that might be a... Uh, oh, no. Oh, oh, jeez. I'm actually glad not to be in the room there. Oh. Uh, that was rough. I feel a lot better, though. Hey. What? You, you sound better. Yeah, I feel better. I Now that I puked that stuff up, holy cow. Hey, hey, a big... What? What was the name of that Chicago song from, uh, I think it was Chicago 16, the 1982 album? Uh, hard for me to say I'm sorry? S- sorry, okay. No, I just I was just checking. Had to be sure. Oh. Nice to have you back, man. Hey, good to be here. I don't know what you're talking about, but anyways. Um... Well, I, you know, I, I heard while you were gone okay. uh, that our friend slash acquaintance, Abby Hilton, has been nominated for a Parsec Award for her podcast uh, a podcast novel, is it? The Prophet of Panamandora. Oh, yeah. So I thought it would be cool to give her a little bit of congratulations on right. that. Right. Definitely, yeah. She deserves it. That's a, a pretty big achievement, I think. I've never been nominated for a Parsec, so I wouldn't know, but... Uh, well, I see. I would imagine it would be uh, honor enough just to be nominated. And now, have you listened to the Prophet of Panamandora podcast? I actually have listened to it. I, I spent a couple of weeks listening to it on my drive to and from work. It's pretty good stuff. The, what you listened to was the novel, right? Mm-hmm. But what I listened to was just her and her brother and then her again. You can download it from Podio Books as three separate podcasts or something like that, I guess you would call it. Or you could get that feed that you listened to where she talked with her brother and that feed, she had the entire thing go from beginning to end. Okay. But sometimes it's the novel and sometimes it's just her shooting the stuff. Yeah. She did basically almost always the novel. I guess while the novel was going on, she did sometimes do a little behind the scenes. Here's Abby, meet your author. Now we're best friends kind of little bits. And she told strange facts about herself and stuff like that. Well, you know, I'll bet that gains her a lot of loyal listeners or fans, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, probably. You know how Stephen King would always do his little afterwords or his little introductions where he'd refer to the constant reader and it engendered this sense of friendship or, you know, some kind of connection between us and him. Right. Yeah, I think she even says so in one of those things. Hey, you guys will care more about me if you know me. But then she goes on to say that she used to taxidermy roadkill. So, Well, I think there's a story in there somewhere. <laughs> I guess. Maybe that's where sentient cats came from. 
<laughs> Perhaps. Well, he, to be honest, I've only listened to two of her podcasts. But in one of them, she talked about us, about the Doonstie. Right. And in that, <laughs> she referred to us as Fred and George Weasley. Ah, uh, yes. And honestly, I mean, seriously, that's probably the greatest compliment I've received about the show. <laughs> Yeah, that you know. Well, okay, so if we are the Weasley brothers, who's Fred and who's George? <laughs> Which one of us is the ugly one? <laughs> I think that's pretty obvious. <laughs> to be honest, I can't tell the difference. They, they're, they're the same person to me. Yeah, I'm, they pretty much are. They're one character with two bodies. Well, yeah, I mean, they speak at the same time. It's not like one is mischievous and one is obedient or one is, is, a, is it's a bad person and one is good or whatever. They are exactly the same. Yeah. I don't know. It's 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 better though than the friggin' dwarves in The Hobbit. I hate to get off on a tangent, but that's what we do. Um, I was talking to my friend who's a huge Tolkien nut fan, and I was just like, "Well, okay, if you were adapting The Hobbit, if you were in charge of making these this into the those movies, if you were Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh and Philippa, uh-huh. uh huh, would you try and differentiate these freaking thirteen dwarfs?" Try and give them all personalities, try and give them all different looks and all that? Or do you develop like three of them really, really good and you give these three <laughs> the majority of the lines and the personality and the depth and the rest are just like glorified extras whose only lines are, I am Balin and I am Bofin and I am... Bifa and Bofa. I remember I listened to that, The Hobbit, in audio and yeah, it used to just drive me crazy to hear the guy be like, Bifa, Bofa, Oin, Gloin. And he would always go through and state off the rhyming pairs. Maybe that's what they could do. They could take all the rhyming or, you know, sound alike guys and kill them. Give them each, <laughs> give them each a personality. You know what I mean? So they're basically like Fred and George, where they're the same guys, but. You know, I don't know. That way you'd only have half as many characters, only be six or seven instead of 13. Lots of times I wish that I had that job. You know, it's like, boy, I wish I could be writing the Alien prequel. But Hobbit adapting that book into two films. Uh huh. Honestly, if they achieve what they achieved with Lord of the Rings, it'll be a greater accomplishment than the Lord of the Rings was. Because... <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't hate The Hobbit or anything like that, but there is probably one solid film's worth of material in The Hobbit, and I have no idea how they're going to do two films, and... Yeah, I think I'd probably agree. I, I wonder if they're, now that they know they got a built-in fan base, if they're just like, hey, now's our chance to... Screw up. Yeah, to score, to cash in. It's like Lucas and his prequels, where he's just like, yeah... Screw those fanboys. I'm going to make a piece of crap and they're going to have to eat it. Oh, no. There was a time when I, I, I came up with that theory. I thought, you know, I think George Lucas has just gotten so irritated with the fanboys always accosting him that he's trying now with these prequels to drive us all away. He's just flipping us all the big old bird saying, here you go. You like Star Wars so much? How do you like this? How do you like Jar Jar? But uh, yeah, that would be difficult. It's like uh, the last Harry Potter. They're doing that as two films. Yeah, but see, I'm I'm pleased with that. I would love to have that job. Of uh, I would love to have Steve Cloves' job of adapting that book into two films. The hard part will be where to end the first film and what do you put. And I won't mind if they rearrange stuff. And I won't mind if they go to Hogwarts instead of waiting till the end of the freaking book for us to see what's been going on there and all this stuff. I, I just... Uh, you won't get upset if they put Shelob in the uh, third film? I don't know. I, I don't care. It worked in the films of Lord of the Rings, but I don't know how different it would have been, how much better or worse it would have been if Shelob had been in Two Towers. I will never know unless somebody out there wants to do an edit, and I don't know that I need to sit there. I'm sure somebody probably has already. Um, yeah, but as far as Harry Potter 7 goes, there is so much stuff in that book. And beyond just the book, so much stuff that Rowling talked about 
that we don't actually see in the book that yeah easily you could do two movies and when they were talking about doing goblet of fire as two movies i was like huh that's interesting i guess i could see how that goes because i think that was the first mega large harry potter book yeah, see, I as far as I was thinking, you know, it seems like the Deathly Hollows of any of the uh, films, you know, there, there's so many times where they're just in the wilderness, not knowing what to do, hiding out in their little tent, that this one probably would be the one that would be the easiest to do as one film versus all the others that they've just had to cannibalize to get rid of all that extra stuff that was uh, in the books so that they could make it a short enough film that, you know, it wasn't like Return of the King and people have to wear catheter when they're watching the film to make it all the way through. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. See, it seemed to me like book four, book five even, and probably book six could have easily been two films, whereas this one, I think it might be a little harder. Well, I, I, I have to disagree with you. I, I don't know how they're going to do the Snape life history, for lack of a better uh, non-spoiler word. <laughs> right. But uh, the, you saw the sp Snape flashback and the Voldemort flashback and stuff in the last two movies, and they took just massive sections of the book. Well, I don't know that the Snape flashback was massive, but it was certainly my favorite part of the fifth book. And they s shrunk it down to be so small, and so many people die in the seventh book that if you only have two hours to tell that story, then you're probably just going to have to shrug off Mad-Eye's death or, or Hedwig's death and things like that because they're not major enough characters in the narrative to care. Right. But if you have four hours to tell the story or five hours is how I would probably do it, then give everybody whose favorite character is Dobby a second to mourn. And I just realized, yeah, this is kind of spoiler-filled, isn't it? I guess. Wait, they, we don't have any listeners. What do I care about a spoiler? Are, are there very many people out there left, you think, that are reading their way through the seven Harry Potter books and haven't made it to the end of seven yet right now? I imagine that every time a movie comes out, there are more people that pick up the books and say, I'm going to read them now. You think I, so? I, but I could be wrong. I wonder if there are people who read each book after the they see the movie and then just wait. Because it's always so rewarding to see a movie and then read the book of it rather than the opposite. There is that. It is definitely, like you said, so rewarding to watch a movie and then go and read the book and it always just opens it up, you know, another 100 percent. But yeah, you can't do that with everything because if, if you had to wait for the movie to come out before you read the book, I guess you would. I don't know. There are people that are like that. I knew a guy who'd never read a book in his life and we told him all these stories that came from books and he's like, wow, that's really cool. They should make a movie of that. Is that me? Because I always feel like they should make movies of stuff. Well, yeah, I agree. But I just thought it was funny because it was basically him saying that he's not going to read a book. But if they made a movie, ah. yeah, he, we'd tell him what the uh, Running Man book was like versus the crappy Schwarzenegger movie that they made. And he's just like, wow, it's really good. Why didn't they make it that way? Another thing I just found out about is that uh, Abby Hill is actually a man. Uh, no. Oh, I was just anticipating. <laughs> like, what could it be? And, you know, and then the first yeah, thing that jumped into That would have been more interesting. But now it turns out that she actually just did an episode of the Drabblecast. Oh, wow. Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, rock on, sister soldier. I wish I did an episode of the Drabblecast. <laughs> Abby and I have left you in the dust, Big Anklevich. <laughs> Wait, we both did an episode. Yeah, we did. Uh, so what was the story called? Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't speaking into the mic. No, you weren't. What, what was the story called? Uh, the story was called Toast by Jamie Lackey. I can imagine what a Drabblecast story called Toast would be. In fact, I've heard it in my mind already. <laughs> it was a pretty uh, interesting episode. I've actually listened to it already. I, I, if you don't listen to the Drabblecast, um, you should check it out. It's a great podcast, and uh, the story's fun. It's strange stories for strange listeners, and this one's definitely strange. But it was enjoyable. And Abby's one of our peeps, so we wanted to make sure that everybody knew... Although it's already been like three weeks since it came out. So how have I not heard it? Don't you have to wait three weeks for the MP3? <laughs> there you go. Library, if you're listening, whatever. Norm. <laughs> you know, we probably ought to just quit. And, and you and I can talk about Comic-Con in Canada and Bofa and Bufa. What are they called? Bifer and Bofa. <laughs> <laughs> Oin. Gloin. And then there's one there are three. Yeah, there's one where there's three that go... I can't express how much I don't like that without sounding like I hate J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> so I, I just won't say it. 
Yeah, well, it's a kid's book, so they did kid stuff. It's much more kidly than the later trilogy. Well, I do not envy the men that have to do that. Men and women. What is your point? Well, this was just an experiment. In the future, we're going to have to do Skype more often, so I thought, uh, let's try it once. Uh, we weren't able to get together this week because of the whole vacation thing. Well, hey, let's let's just bring this one to a halt and quit while we're behind. only three points behind, yes. And, and and you know what? We'll we'll save the story of me taking my pants off in front of Ryan Reynolds till next week. Okay. Uh. Okay. And that will just. In, in fact, Arero T. Can you maybe delete any reference of me taking my pants off in front of Ryan Reynolds, please? What did he say? Uh, he says yes. Okay. Hey, thank you, man. I think we've 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 gotten over that hurdle. I think we're we're actually friends now. Thank you. All right, so that was our show. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Matt Kluchar. Wait, I didn't expect you to say that. What? Well, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> oh, our chief weapon is surprise. So, uh, surprise and fear. Two. Our two chief weapons are surprise and fear. And uh, ruthless efficiency. Th- three. Three. Our three chief weapons are surprise, fear, ruthless efficiency. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. If you'd like to submit a story to the Dune Steve, send it to submissions at dunesteve.com. Nobody expects this. Please visit our website at www.dunesteve.com and check out our submission guidelines. Cardinal Biggles. Yes? Fetch the I, I was over here with these Vikings. Are you going somewhere with this, guys? It's the soft pillow. <gasps> the soft pillow. Okay. The Dune oh, Steve Audio Fiction it? Magazine yeah. is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Yes. I confess. Uh, who said that? <laughs> Take two. You just have that. I guess it's the nostalgia value, you know. It's 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 like one of the reasons why a Christmas story can play, you know, twenty four times in a row or whatever on TBS at Christmas time because that nostalgia value that that film has just hits home for people who were, weren't even, you know, who were born in like nineteen eighty, you know. Okay, hey, we're gonna cut this part out, but uh huh. My dad used to friggin' hate that movie. Really? Before they would show it like the twenty four times <laughs> a year. Or whatever, and he'd be like, "This movie is garbage." And he's like, "I everything is garbage to him." He's I, my mom used to always say that he was born like a hundred years too late, kind of thing. <laughs> he would have loved to have lived in the cowboy days, and just everything is, is rotten and garbage. And he would love to have solved all of his problems with his fists or guns. And uh, yeah, he just hated it. And it was too bad because back then, when I only saw it every three years or whatever, I loved that movie. But my sister really got into it, and she decided that every year when we open presents that's going to be on and uh, yeah a couple so of years you ago can go, that's mine. mine that's right i was going to put that at the start of our uh, christmas one but i forgot uh, to well, i'm going to get that quote and have it go that's mine <laughs> this is mine this is mine <laughs> but it's funny a couple of years ago that was on we we're just waiting for like my sister to get off work or out of prison or something like that and we were watching it and my dad said that's exactly how it was and i was like what He's like, we used to gather around the radio like that. I remember listening to that. And he started talking. He's like, that looks just like this. And, and yeah, he started getting all nostalgic and talking about the 50s. And I think it's more like the 40s. Is it the 40s? Anyway, I don't. Because the radio was. Yeah, that's right. Is radio no TV? Replaced by uh, TV somewhere in the 50s. But it could have been. I'm not sure you know. where exactly, but. Well, uh, in Back to the Future, that's 55, and they got the first TV set on the block. So yeah. that's cool. Anyway, it's so it just funny how he 50s. he changed his tune on that. And, of course, we'll cut this out. I don't know why I'm still talking like we're talking to an audience. but Yeah, you even said your sister got out of prison, which is... Which is a comment I would make on the show. Yeah, unnecessary. Okay, but this is for the show.